Welcome to Planetary Gig Talk, Tales of Music and Magic. I'm your host, Jefferson Glassy, Chief Spiritual Dude of the Planetary Gig Society, whose mission is making connections through music with the intention of bringing peace. And today, once again, here in the worldwide headquarters of the Planetary Gig Society in Studio One, happy to have to be able to talk with today a fabulous guitar player and friend, Frank Fatuski. Welcome, Frank. Thanks, Jeff. It's so great that you guys were here. Um, We've known each other for a while. Uh, Last night was pretty awesome. Uh, You're doing your traveling troubadour thing with Grant Dermody, uh, having various gigs and workshops up and down the East Coast. And last night was a lot of fun. It was World Singing Day, so that was pretty special. You guys got some people singing some songs. Oh, it was yeah, it was serendipitous that 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 day coincided with us being here, and uh, it's been a, a heck of a run so far. We started up in Bangor, Maine, and been making our way down through uh, the Northeast, and now here we are in the D.C. area. Well, you have a really good vibe together, and uh, you know, in some ways, it's what it's about: planetary gigs, more gigs around the planet, more music and homes, that type of thing. But um, I'd like to ask a little bit about uh, you know, you're up in uh, Maine now. You were from New Jersey, um, and uh, worked in the schools there, taught people audio engineering, I think. You can explain yep. that a little bit more. Uh, so we want to get into that, but uh, maybe a little bit about, you know, growing up, uh, you talked about your grandmother and her influence on uh, music in your life. So when you think back, uh, uh, you know, could you tell us a little bit about uh, growing up, uh, music in your life? I don't know whether you took lessons or just hung with family and that was it, but yeah, well, uh, my grandmother is one of my biggest, if not biggest, influences. Piano player. Uh, she was in vaudeville. Uh, young actress, too. She t- toured with uh, Helen Hayes' touring troupe. Wow. And then, uh, you know, as she got older, she had met uh, my soon-to-be grandfather. Mm-hmm. And uh, so she left the professional entertainment world but she uh carried that on through her life uh she was a very outward person uh very elegant woman and her house was uh i like to i call it piano centric mm-hmm. and uh so a lot uh revolved around the the piano in the house so whenever her children would come to the house uh, if we were all there together or uh individually uh, a lot took place around the piano, and she played a lot of the tunes uh, that were popular for her growing up, but, uh, you know, a lot of, of the songbook of America. So a lot of Tin Pan Alley music, a lot of blues, uh, a lot of show tunes, uh, and uh, it was just always joyous being around it. So she really instilled a great love of music. Did and her children play music, too? Her children didn't. Isn't that interesting? Music. So across, uh, over that, skipped a generation, and uh, so, so. all her grandchildren do. So your parents did not play music. No, but it was an important part of of growing up. Yeah, in I your mean, own ha- in your own house, did they have music on the Victrola or whatever? You know. Yeah. Well, it. yeah. There was a a uh, you know a lot of uh, great records were in the house. Uh, and the, the radio was, I remember my, my father was in government work, but, uh, so his days, days were the weekend where he would really, I mean, he was always there as a, a strong father figure, but I remember hanging out with him on Saturday and he'd be down in his, in his workshop and he'd have W-O-R, W-O-R on New York radio mm-hmm. station AM and, uh, they would play, uh, much like college music stations are now, you know, you'd have half-hour, hour-long segments of certain types of music. So you'd have uh, the the New York orchestra playing, 
And then you then it would go from that to uh, like mariachi music. <laughs> and then from there it would go to opera. You have the New York Opera on. So it was, you know, I don't necessarily remember being in that specific order, but yeah. it was always, you know, this change of music all day long, and he loved it all. Wow. And so that was, you know, this uh, world music, if you will, was always circulating through the house. And so uh, you would go to your uh, grandmother's, who was kind of in the middle of everything, I think, geographically yeah. and all. And uh, how early do you remember being there? And was she sitting at the piano? Did she encourage people to get up at the piano? Was, I mean, what was sort of the scene? I know you, you uh, put that into music in that song that you did. Um, what was co- sort of the, the visual scene and what was going on and how you you yourself became interested in you know in saying gosh i really want to do this well i can only say that when i became aware of it was just uh it, my earliest memory of that was just just became apparent to me you know and then i remember sitting on the the piano bench with her uh and then you know her showing me uh i say me now but i remember her also my siblings uh, and my cousins, so that was, uh, I also speak in general terms, too, how she related to all of her grandkids. So she would really try to, uh, you know, try to teach me the piano. My, my siblings and my cousins took more to the piano than I did. Uh, but she, she would just uh, instill this... Uh, this great love of music, and it, it brought family together, uh, it brought friends together, uh, and I like that. Yeah, you it's know? pretty nice, isn't it? And then, you know, <laughs> I, I, uh, I explored, you know, growing up, uh, some other avenues that I wanted to do, but, and, and I got pretty good at, uh, you know, woodworking and uh, some historic house restoration but I always came back to the guitar so as I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do I kept coming back to playing music and then one day I had an epiphany and I just said well geez this is what I'm supposed to be doing (laughs) you know and uh, so I you know I jumped into the deep end of the pool with that and uh, my head's still above water so (laughs) good so how old were you do you remember when you picked up a guitar uh did you take lessons from people did you have a basis in music so you just noodled around and learned things what type of music did you play initially and when did you come to sort of what you do now which then you can describe but acoustic piedmont alternating yeah. thumb well i started playing. off uh, my i grew up watching hee haw and uh the musicians on there I was attracted to, so I was initially attracted to the banjo. And uh, so there was Roy Clark and Buck Owens were the hosts. And uh, Roy Clark is just a, an all around fantastic musician, consummate musician. And there was also a guy in the house band called Buck Trent, fantastic banjo player. And uh, so I started to get attracted to that and then I did you have a banjo then I did I, I started out on the banjo when I was about 12 13 uh-huh. years old and uh, I got into that and then uh, I had shared a, a room with my older brother and then he so he had his album collection out and was listening you know the albums he would bring home were uh, you know, David Bromberg albums uh, Mike Bloomfield uh, some Grateful Dead uh, and you know music along those lines, and I liked it. So when I was reading the liner notes. Who's Reverend Gary Davis? <laughs> you know some of the songs that they were doing on that. Who's, you know, Furry Lewis? Who's Mississippi John Hurt? You know the names go on. And uh, so then that was my step into that world, and then the well is deep. And I just kept going and discovering all these different people. And I said, boy, that's what I like. And the clincher there is a, a lot of the, the guys I was attracted to, like Reverend Davis, Blind Blake, 
uh, Mississippi John Hurt, uh, the East Coast Piedmont players, if you will, their guitar playing had very piano-like quality. So now there's mm. my connection. You know, I had a hard enough time trying to play the piano, but I was developing my skills on the on the on the banjo as finger picking, but now I'm attracted to the guitar. And so those players, like I said, have a piano like quality to their playing. So then when I was about fifteen or sixteen, I uh, picked up the guitar. Well, the way that you play, thinking about it, um, it's not just strumming. It's not even just sort of one finger in addition to the thumb picking out melodies and various whatever. Um, but you got all your fingers going on, so that's kind of piano-like in a way. Uh, sure. You use all you use ten fingers playing a piano. Uh, you you pretty much use ten fingers playing the guitar. Yeah, and uh, Reverend Gary Davis put a. Uh, he kind of quantified that and said, you, you know, piano, you have your left hand and your and your right hand, obviously. So when you're finger picking, your thumb is like your left hand and your picking fingers are uh, your right hand. So you get to maintain that bass line, uh, either a, a boom chuck or an alternating bass or a walking bass line. And then you get to pick out the melody uh, with your... Uh, fingers so yeah it's 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 the type of guitar that really grabs me the most as i try to try to learn the thick finger picking i just completely love so when when you were in sort of the midst of your maybe deepest learning i'm guessing that was probably in your teens or maybe later about the guitar and the finger style and how, how you play um how, how did you do it i mean people uh, say, oh, I just don't have that talent, I can't do it, I can't do this, can't do that. But I think a lot of it comes from hard work and intention. I mean, you were probably pretty focused on it, I'm guessing. Well, yeah, I got focused on it, and part of the focus was uh, going through high school without a girlfriend and a good record collection. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's the key to everything. Um, so it, it just, uh, you experimented a lot. Did you take lessons? I, I did take some lessons, uh, but they uh, they weren't they weren't really weekly lessons. You know, I took took them for a while, and then uh, that kind of learning got too overwhelming for me because I needed to digest what I had. I couldn't I couldn't personally I couldn't build on it that way. You know, where okay, you do this, and then you during this week you accomplish that and then we're gonna review that and then build on that I needed longer time to digest and uh, and and I think because of a, the way I approach a lot of things and learn them it's got to be a deep learning mm. on that so I take that say that week's worth of time and I just have to really go deep and get as much as I can out of that little bit of a lesson and then move on so the way it worked out, I would take a couple weeks, digest that, and then, you know, hook up with that teacher again a few months later, and then build on it that way. But you did a lot of sort of self-learning. Oh yeah, oh, did a lot of playing with other people, and uh, you know, people that, and still today that. Uh, and I, someone that is. Uh, I can't say better, but more accomplished than you are, because then you, uh, that forces you to oh, right. raise the bar on yourself yeah. to keep up with that person. And, uh, and listen to what they're doing. Well, sure. Yeah. And, and, but that said, you know, I've also, uh, I don't take anybody's uh, musicianship or skill for granted, because I've also had students uh, that have come in and they've done something with what I've taught them and they've done it different and it's been you got to show me how you did that mm. so now here I'm learning from someone that uh, is new to the game but they've accomplished something because they approached they've used the information I've given them and uh, 
but approach it at a different angle and have come up with something that, hey, I didn't think of that. You so, know, can you show me that? Yeah. So it's, you know, it's, that's the beauty of music, though. It's, you know, uh, it's that interpretation, that digestion of it, uh, and then giving it back. Uh, so that was, you're, you're talking about teaching students guitar. Yeah. Uh, but you also taught, I mean, I guess your, your main, you, you taught courses. Uh, right, I taught at a in, vocational school for 15 years, uh, audio recording but that you know that is uh wasn't specifically music uh but a lot of it was and but teaching uh music and trying to teach someone music i was able to bring that skill to my uh i never thought i was going to be a teacher quite Mm -hmm. frankly it's something that came my way i had already had a background in uh live sound hmm. and uh so an opportunity came up at a vocational school that a guy that had uh, a great friend of mine dennis burke started this program he was a professional uh musician and also a had a commercial recording studio and uh, he knew i had this background so he's had started this program and uh it took off and then he goes are you interested in uh, coming to be? A, first, I started as a teacher's aide, and then the program just kept getting better and more popular. Assistant teacher, and then I was offered a full-time job. So I did that for 15 years. And you were teaching guitar at the same time? Yep, I had a, a few students yeah. at that time. So working But I also had a young family, too, so this job <laughs> came at a, at a right time where, you know, me, Musicians don't carry a whole lot of health benefits with them. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just... Well, yeah, not so far. Maybe we can work on that too. But So you've had a lot of students, both music students and also audio students, I guess you would call them. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the things you know we inquire about and want to search out in these uh, discussions is, um, you know, what sort of... Uh, how have you seen music have an effect on people's lives? Uh, what's been the uh, any instances, examples from you know teaching, but maybe also your playing career, of sort of the power of music, um, how it comes across for what it means to kids, uh, that sort of thing. Well, the uh, well, music is. Uh, humanity's first language and it's been used uh, both positively and negatively so its power is incredible Uh, it it, you know it moves it moves people to tears and compassion and it also moves them to war you know that's the part we gotta we gotta address yeah and uh, but I've uh, you know, uh, well, f- f- first I'll talk how it affects me, like the song I wrote for my grandmother. Yeah. And I was trying to write a song, and this noodling, just, you know, as a lot of musicians do, uh, just as like a pressure release when you're trying to write a song, all of a sudden it started to take on a life. And... The, the noodling, the chords that I was playing with started to remind me of uh, my grandmother and the way we started out our discussion tonight of uh, back at her house around the piano. And uh, so then it's like certain smells, new cut grass, you know, something's cooking in the kitchen. All of a sudden, that experience takes you back and you're 12 years old again. So... There's that happening. And as I've related that song to people, and then I've played it for them, it is then, they've come up to me afterward and said, hey man, I was 12 years old again. (laughs) You know, I was back with my father. I was back with my grandmother. I was back, you know, in some uh, situation that meant the world to them. 
And there they were in that moment in time, you know, they were at a place that was very special to them. So, you know, music is a, is a great conduit to, you know, the heart. Yeah. It's sort of timeless too. Um, the, uh, in one of my favorite books we've talked about, uh, before with others, uh, Victor Wooten's um, The Music Lesson, he says, well, you know, the, the music is already there. It's like the Pieta, Michelangelo said, well, it was already in the stone. I just had to bring it out. Sure. What you're describing in terms of that song for your grandmother sounds like that, in a sense. Um, well, yeah, Reverend Gary Davis said something like that, too, when he was brought into the... Uh the uh, well, Peter Paul and Mary recorded his song "If I Had My Way" on their first album, and up until that point, a lot of people uh, outside of uh, the musician world didn't know who Reverend Gary Davis was. So when they were working out the contract on that, you know, Peter Paul and Mary said, "Well, we didn't write that song. It's just gentleman uh, Reverend Davis." So they said, "Well, we got to get him in here." And so as they were hammering out the you know, the publishing and the things, and they uh, asked him about that song, If I Had My Way. Did you write that song? He said, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, uh, no, I didn't write that song. It was revealed to me. Mm. Well, he was an amazing uh, player. I remember hearing that his his wife didn't really let him play the blues, so he would play church music. I guess he was a reverend. But then he would go out and play with all the others, this other kind of devil's music, too. Um, it's kind of interesting the way that is and the way people look at, at music in different ways, as you were talking about. Oh, yeah, absolutely. He, 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 uh, he, he refrained from playing blues. Well, when he, quick, when he uh, had gone to New York City. He was originally uh, Blind Gary Davis. And he traveled up there with Blind Boy Fuller and uh, Sonny Terry. Soon after he got to uh, New York is when th the spirit called him. And then he uh, became, uh, in and around that time, Reverend Gary Davis and put aside playing blues. Although a lot of his uh, gospel and spiritual tunes have a, a have a blues music base to them, but the lyrics certainly aren't. And uh, when his wife was around, he refrained from playing any blues. Hmm. Uh, but you know, his students would be able to coax him, coax him out of them. Yeah. And sometimes at some gigs he would he would do it. But also times sometimes at gigs he would. Uh, you know, you'd go there to hear him, and uh, he was the he was a real deal, as uh, as far as a a, a preacher, and a reverend. Uh, he was really full of the spirit, and so sometimes he'd play a song, and all of a sudden, the spirit would get him, and you would have, uh, for a good part, if not the rest of the cake, you'd have a a, a sermon, a powerful. Wow. Well, so yeah, that's another indication of the way uh, music moves people into different directions so you've been uh, uh, playing I met you several years ago uh, Trish Briley uh, who was John Jackson's manager uh, I know you came to the house and maybe it was Grant's con concert I can't quite remember um, so you you really you haven't exact maybe you retired and you're just doing music full-time in the and you're yep I'm back to doing it full-time now I'm not I'm no longer teaching I was uh, you know, semi-professional doing that, that during that 15 years. Uh, but school afforded me to do it during any holiday time or in the summer. And then my kids are all grown up now. And some the way the, the planets aligned, I was able to then get back into it full time. And so when you go on the, when you go on the road with Grant or whenever you're playing... Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about just how it makes you feel, but how, what, what do you observe in the people when they're, when they're, when they're listening, 
when they are at a, like a the house concert we had last night. Um, what there there must be something that keeps you coming back to doing that. So yeah, well the just the interaction. Uh, you know, when people come to see you, especially at a house concert, that's what they're there for. You know, and then when you connect with them, it just uh, you know p- playing music is great. But when you connect with someone, it just takes it to another uh, level of of enjoyment, and then the fellowship that's involved with it. And then uh, I prefer so in a performance situation. I don't like I don't like a stage, and I like to be as close to the the uh, audience as possible. Because that just brings the energy closer. When there's when when there starts to be distance, I can feel it, and I don't like that. So the closer you get, the more they are then a part of the performance, and you can talk. And if you know you get a a laugh, a cry, or or whatever, that is just uh, as much as playing the instrument. You're playing the room. Trying to get the uh, the actual connection being sort of the things that thing that makes it really work that really makes it enjoyable and special. Absolutely. Um, so you know, one of the things here at uh, Planetary Gig Society is trying to make the better world a better place through music, and there's so many amazing musicians and orchestras and and it's just phenomenal to me what musicians do i've been thinking of them as a quantum physicist of love recently (laughs) because it's very complex you know it takes a lot of intention figuring out stuff i mean it's it's really is kind of magic what comes what musicians can make come out of you know material objects um so one of the questions i like to ask is you know, what is it that we can do more? People can do more. Musicians can do more. Any thoughts about um, how we really can use that power of music to, you know, make a, a better world? How can we do that? Well, I think a lot of people have to take off their blinders. If people are walking around, you know, and not they have no peripheral vision and their and their uh, sight ahead of them is short you know and they live in their own world you know they're not willing to uh, be neighborly in many ways and that's a a barrier that has to be broken down and music is one that can do it yeah people often are afraid of each other walking down the street nobody wants to talk to you that sort of thing the greatest thing to do is is uh, to, to understand uh, someone is break bread with them and listen to music with them. Those two things, because they bring their, uh, especially culturally, their, their music. Not pop, not pop, not pop music in the sense of what we're told to listen to, but the popular music of uh, that person's. Uh, country beliefs it's all powerful you know and then then you can get to understand them uh yeah food and music you were talking about yeah. last night food and music can bring people together absolutely all right well uh frank it's been great talking with you uh really appreciate your time and and uh you know, well like dis- likewise discussing some of the these uh you know, music in your life and what you've seen and all. So really appreciate it. Thanks very much, and uh, we'll see you soon. Well, thank you, Jeff. You've been listening to Planetary Gig Talk, Tales of Music and Magic. I'm your host, Jefferson Glassy, Chief Spiritual Dude of the Planetary Gig Society. We talk with musicians and others about the power of music and how we can use music to help create a better world. Please check out our website, www.planetarygigs.org, for
for information about some of the organizations promoting music and musicians. Resources about the power of music. Books, movies, articles, including new research on music and the brain. We welcome your support. The Planetary Gig Society is a Section 501c3 charitable organization, and you can donate on the website. You also can receive a free email signature block demonstrating your support for Planetary Gig Society. Please follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Planetary Gigs. And we want to thank fabulous musician and teacher Eric Weinberg of Little Eric Studios for the Planetary Gig Talk music titled Chill Kid, It's Saul. So please check out Planetary Gig Talk on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. Subscribe and hear all the upcoming episodes. Thanks very much.